Welcome back. It is week seven. It is the second half of semester and we are underway with the applications side of the course. Now what's going to happen over the next five episodes of the lecture content is we're going to change format a little bit and go for a structured approach of looking at the different ways in which you can use the internet. Audio, video, image, text, markets, community, mobile. In that, each of these weeks will have a quite similar structure and they will get us to think through, apply and use some of the theoretical frameworks that have been covered in the first half of the semester. And the idea here is that I want to be able to talk through some of my understanding as a user of most of the case study sites that I'm going to demonstrate, how I've been able to use these and how the theories around ideas like co-creation of value, around price theory and product theory have come to fruition through my practice. So as I've used it, how have I seen it as a marketer? And also to get you used to the idea of thinking about the production side. It's very easy to think about consumption and the consumption of a website. So as a person who has Facebook and consuming Facebook as a Facebook user who talks to other Facebook users, that's a different experience than if you are running Facebook and a Facebook page and you're trying to get people to interact with your content. So we have a few different ways of exploring things. The theory frameworks will be pointed out to you at the start of each of the upcoming episodes so that you have them as a prompted recall. So your two questions, your prompt recall question. Question number one is when you come across an idea uh, inside the lectures, how can I use this in my project? I know that for the ebook, ET, I asked you to create a focus and to think about what is the platform you're going to use. Now that you've had a few weeks of using that platform, you may find value in extending across and applying across to do things such as use an audio platform in support or use a video platform as a promotion tool, as a platform for distribution of other products. This idea is that we start from a core. We always start somewhere. And with your market segmentation and your product composition, it was about giving you a base from which you can then expand rather than throwing you in the deep end and saying, hey, congratulations, there's 32 different things you gotta do right now, immediately, or priority one. That's not how it, sometimes it's how it works, but it's not a good way of doing business. The second thing that we want to be able to do is get comfortable with talking like marketers about our experiences. And along the way, when I raise the idea of the different theoretical frameworks, I want us to start thinking as, all right, okay, it's non-financial pricing, that's co-creation value, and articulating it, talking about it as a marketer. What theories explain what I'm doing? How can I explain what's happening in a language that makes sense to me as a marketer, but also would make sense to other marketers as we use our share common vocabulary of things we know as marketers. All right, so let's get into this audio. Now, the first thing on audio and the internet is, this is an area that's actually had a number of peaks and troughs. So when the internet first rolled out in the 90s, there was streaming audio was difficult. Dial-up modems didn't support the bandwidth, and the quality of audio was bad. There wasn't enough capacity to make it good. Roll forward to today, and you can have full-fledged, fully operational radio stations that just solely broadcast out on the digital platforms. Uh, so what we're going to do is audio here is going to be as any platform, service, or system that prioritizes the non-visual, non-video, distribution. Now, YouTube, and I would have linked to more than a couple of them, has a range of long play, what are effectively audio tracks, 
Uh, you put them on in the background, you get on with the rest of your whatever you're doing in the foreground. They still count as video. Here we're thinking about podcasts, we're thinking about streaming, we're thinking about radio, we're thinking about single play, download a music track. We're thinking about the podcasts where it's episodic and released on a schedule. We're also thinking about the various things that you've got in terms of capturing, recording, producing and distributing. One quick footnote here is that uh, I'm old enough to have used MySpace right at the start and its big revolution was that when you went to a MySpace page it would play music and there was a playlist that you could have that would play the user's favorite selected songs or songs they uploaded because copyright was less of a thing back then. It uh, wasn't great and in my for my sins and there are many uh, the time I was doing some research that involved uh, finding a specific image of Princess Diana uh, looking straight down the lens of a camera, I heard the MIDI version of Candle in the Wind far too many times for any human to have survived unscathed. So embedded music into a website it was a technology that we had and then we went, this is a really dumb idea, let's get rid of it. So for you, what's the value proposition of an audio product? For me, a soundscape is something you can build uh, around and to enhance your own personal, and then I think a personal self-service scape. One of the challenges I face every time I record these videos is that I record them in silence. Whereas for the rest of my operational day-to-day -day work, with the exception of when I'm teaching or I'm recording content, I'm usually there's usually some form of music playing in the background. So it's a very unusual experience here where I break out from my surface soundscape and present in silence. So let's talk about a couple of theories. First theory, pricing. Now, financial price and the consumption of music, uh, we're reasonably familiar around that, where you're looking at things like you buy, you pay money to buy an MP3, you pay or an MP4. You give money to iTunes or Google, Google Music, and they, in return, give you music. Uh, now, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. You can subscribe. You can pay one-off. Uh, my biggest frustration in my internet existence is I do not wish to subscribe to monthly payments for a radio station. I like to curate my listening, so I like to buy my album and download it. Apple doesn't like that because Apple wants an ongoing cash flow. And my concern over time is eventually Apple's going to go, what if we don't let you? What if you can only rent and lease access to music? At which point I'm hoping someone's going to sweep through and just smash them. But this is what we're used to in terms of consumption. In terms of production, you will quite often be able to buy premium capacity. So if you are looking at the production, you're a musician, you've got a band or a solo project, and you create your music, you want to be able to share that music out to the community. And places like SoundCloud give you the opportunity to have a free account that hosts a finite amount of data, usually like not unreasonable, but not excessive. And then you've got a paid premium option where you can pay extra for more features and more functionality. And this is in order to be able to distribute your content to a listening audience. Now, what gets really interesting is when you look at the business model and I pay money to SoundCloud to distribute my files for free to my audience. Something's gone slightly wrong in the value proposition there, but equally what the idea is that something like a SoundCloud then becomes a springboard upon which you can monetize through other pathways. Uh, this is where an alternate, something like Bandcamp, which will profile both of them in a moment, creates a platform whereby you can sell for sell basically using um, premium or premium and you can then have 
your content purchased by an audience and you have a revenue split. For the record, and literally the record, uh, Sieg Sieg Sputnik is the name of the band who in the 1980s put advertising onto their album. Uh, a trick of the physical medium of the vinyl record is that there were gaps between the tracks so that you could place, literally place the head of the needle and play it onto the track at the right point. They sold that space. Uh, they managed to convince L'Oreal to buy space on the album to sell hair gel to punks. Malcolm McLaren took one look at punk and said, I can monetize that like nothing else. Non-financial to price time. So there's a few things in here. As a distributor, one of your challenges is that music is real time. It's time consuming. So if you're talking about trying to distribute a two hour mix set, a live DJ mix set, your listener needs to have two hours upon which to listen to it. Uh, HOR, the German nightclub that I listen to off YouTube, runs one hour sets. So I know I've got some bounded time. If I want to listen to this and it's 45 minutes to class, I'm going to be using my singles collection. Equally, there's some things around the creation of the music can be very high intensity and very high effort. And qu there is quite a steep learning curve to being able to create the audio. But the consumption is the opposite. It's very low effort to consume audio. And there's a very relatively low learning curve for how to get the audio from platform to ears. Now, risk and lifestyle cost as a consumer, there's quite a bit in terms of risk. Uh, there's quite variable, and one of my great frustrations of life is when I encounter music from an artist and that track is a complete anomaly in their collection. And I find myself going, "This, I love this single that you've created, I love this one track, but there is nothing like it in the rest of your catalogue. Oh. So I've spent you know, 30 bucks on an album, only to be very disappointed with most of that album. Or, instead, I look at it and go, well, this single is now worth, this one track is worth $30 to me. Uh, lifestyle costs for music and audio, mostly. Um, it's established that audio just being omnipresent is a thing. Uh, most lifestyle, there's very limited lifestyle cost. Depending on the lyrics, there might be some higher rate lifestyle cost. Now, in terms of distribution, there's one of the things that's really interesting here is that as an audio function, uh, it took me three years to figure out what convertible and tangible was. And sheet music that you play at home, you print out the notes and you play it along on your own equipment. And as opposed to... Functionally, most of what we deal with in audio is closer to digital tangible. There's a lot of work around MP3s, MP4s, downloadable files, files that you then transfer to devices. Uh, a CD is basically a convertible and tangible, transportable tangible. Uh, I was thinking convertible and tangible because I was thinking, oh, you just burn your own CD, because I'm old. Uh, these days it'll be more like load up the phone and then stream to the end car Bluetooth, or but that's still file and it still takes up hard drive space. So it's very dominated by digital tangible. In the interim, uh, we have a few other things. The mediated intangible. Now, the music that starts the opening of each episode of content in this subject is licensed. And it's licensed through Envato under a mediated intangible. I have the temporary right to use that audio. And it's a really interesting challenge as a marketer, because uh, in my YouTube project, I use a lot of short audio from to create different content um, experiences. So I have a number of mediated intangibles. As a producer, as someone who has created music and made my music available across the internet, my biggest challenge is the impermanence of my distribution channels. 
Uh, mp3.com was where I had most of my music stored. mp3.com no longer exists as a music broadcast service that was designed for indie and solo artists. There were a lot of problems. Lots of things went wrong there. Uh, not least of which was the major labels smashed it into the ground and then burnt down the ashes. But functionally, distribution here, what you are interested in is either can I get it as a license through Mediated Intangible or do I have the capacity to have my files and my musical infrastructure stored somewhere that can then be on sold to my target audience. So let's talk about case studies. Uh, I've mentioned a couple on the way through. I am a big fan of SoundCloud. As a producer of music, I have liked the way SoundCloud operates. Now, one of the things I should say for audio is that this has some of the biggest challenges when it comes to copyright of anything anywhere. And that's because the major labels, major music labels, recognize the business model threat that SoundCloud, Bandcamp, and these other independent publication platforms present. And the challenge for you as a marketer is a channel like SoundCloud enables you to self-publish. And you can self-publish anything that's audio onto there. There's a niche for it. If you know your market, you know what they're looking for. You can pay premiums to get better publication, better publishing options. But also, one of the things that SoundCloud did really well at the outset, but doesn't do very well at the moment, is it had a much better music recommendation infrastructure through hashtags, through uh, the ability of the audience to tag content and suggest and to leave notes in uh, tracks. Of course, that got abused. That's why it's gone away to some extent. Uh, but also hashtag-based uh, musical distribution. Music is one of the hardest places to do product positioning because there is so many different ways in which to describe music, so many subgenres. So curation in music is actually much harder uh, from a product perspective. So an MP3 is an MP3, an MP4 is an MP4, they don't change. But the difference between heavy metal, new metal, baby metal, hair metal, those aren't genres I even listen to. So that there, are, I don't listen to metal. There are four genres that I can name out of there, compared to say, trance, hip hop, house, Chicago house, Detroit house, happy house. Each of these genres is a positioning strategy as much as it is a product descriptor. So being able to suitably position yourself in the right genre so that other artists who are comparable to you are within easy reach is actually very much bringing up the wheel of retail, the retail uh, theory of it's the magic mile uh, in retailing where you do retail clustering of stores of a similar nature co-locate so that you're building up a bigger chance at tapping into that overall demand. And this is why all the restaurants are together in the same physical location, all the fashion stores are together in the same physical location, is that you want to bring a consumer who has a need for something that you and your ally competitors around you all serve so that you have a better chance of getting that customer. Same for music. If you're in the genre, you want to support other artists of the genre and be supported by them and be easy to find because someone who likes uh, UK Speed Garage is going to like a lot of different artists in UK Speed Garage, not just the one. So SoundCloud was good at it. They got a little rough and they haven't been as good for curation and discovery recently. Uh, Bandcamp is the second place. I don't actually have anything up on Bandcamp. Um, I've bought a few things there. It's a really interesting uh, wholesaler, retailer proposition in that Bandcamp also offers some secondary capacity. So as well as just being able to put up 
buy my music and buy, download my MP3s, it can do brokerage of tickets, it can do brokerage for merchandise. So it's much more of a one-stop shop. Uh, it has an audience discovery function, which is better than SoundCloud at the moment, but that's a bit variable. Uh, it's certainly much better than YouTube for discovery, but much worse for recommendation. It's really uh, an interesting challenge because Bandcamp is much more uh, positioned as a standalone. An artist will refer you back. So it's a retail outlet that's a bit of a specialty store that some will say, hey, go here. So it's got a lot more personal selling attached to it than it does, say, Open Discovery. Anchor FM, uh, this is a channel for podcasts. Now, I am a meet I'm a middle-aged white guy with opinions I don't have a podcast precisely because I'm a middle-aged white guy with opinions and all of us have got podcasts um, it seems and I want to continue being part of the resistance of not having a podcast instead I've got a YouTube show but that's not the point the point is am in anchor FM the challenge here is that a podcast is very, not very easy to create. A podcast once created is harder to disseminate than you would expect. SoundCloud and Bandcamp aren't very good as podcast platforms because they're not really thought of as podcast medium. So Anchor FM's role here is that this, this is a brokerage. It's fee-based. Uh, it says all for, fee, for free, but believe me, you can top up. Um, you can buy premium here. It's freemium, free, and premium. But also what it does is that it brokers out your content into other channels, and those other channels then broker back. Uh, so you can get some arrangements here for sponsorship, advertising, and revenue. It's very interesting from a co-creation perspective of how much work you would then have to do beyond once you've got uh, your Anchor account set up is getting that organic traffic doing the pull strategy at the front. So Anchor is less of a push strategy, it's more of a pull strategy from distribution and retailing, and they will help you get your content onto the requisite platforms. It's your job to drive demand for that content. Ah, Spotify, everybody's favorite. It is a consumer focus, and it has a commercial reseller, uh, TuneCore. So I'm gonna flip straight to TuneCore to talk about this. If you are producing music and you want to be on Spotify, you have to go through a brokerage. This is what differentiates Spotify from Bandcamp or SoundCloud. SoundCloud, you sign up, you create your account, you put your stuff up there and they stream it out to the world. Bandcamp, same deal. Upload it and your responsibility. Spotify runs brokerage. And this is in no small part because of the experience of places like mp3.com where files, artists were uploading their content and the big fight that broke out, I think it was Rage Against the Machine uploaded their own music to mp3.com and so it was Rage Against the Machine and Link, Linkin Park both released tracks onto mp3.com that they hadn't released through their recording label and the recording label sued mp3.com to get the content taken down because the band had gone and bypassed the distribution channel. Weird moments in musical history. But also what happened there is that because the artists were creating content, putting that content, like any other user, like just an ordinary guy like me, the major labels saw the writing on the wall. They saw that if a band could reach an audience without the need to broker through the major labels, then their gravy train was over. So Spotify needs to sign deals and negotiate contracts with the big majors to get access to those catalogs of material. Consequence of which is they want to ensure that anything that comes into them is filtered to ensure that it's not coming from someone who shouldn't be putting it there. 
And initially you might be thinking, oh, someone uplo uploading copyrighted material that they don't own. It's more of the case of an artist uploading copyrighted material they do own, but are under contract for someone else. That's the big thing they're watching for, because that was what killed mp3.com. Effectively, at the end, it became a threat to the big business models. Spotify is still ticking along, bleeding out um, investor money because it's playing nicely with the big major labels who see it as a good way for them to earn more money. Uh, being an artist on there kind of sucks. The amount of money you get is non-existent. But then again, being an artist signed for a major label, if you're not one of the top tier uh, that's kept in good uh, finances to encourage the rest of people to, well, cop it horribly. It's a, it's a bad business model. It's a bad world. All right, theory and application. Music is not a place to get rich. Music is a place where if you are rich, you can maintain that wealth. I want to take a couple of things here to talk about uh, this paper. There's a couple of ideas in this paper, one of which is actually quite uh, self-referential. Another one is that this is a big market segmentation, and this is an example of the use of big data to create a meaningful data set that can be of value. Now, admittedly, it used Reddit as a data point, but it had a couple of interesting ideas here, and this is the idea of creating the co-creation of extra musical sharing and the way in which value through music sharing also created alternate means and alternate meanings for particular items of music. So there is a certain aspect to which music in itself is a standalone message system, but it can become a meme and it can be tied to certain visual textual and other cues. On the other side, uh, when they actually pulled up the data and I was reading this paper for the, the first time uh, and they talked about the different things and it's like older audiences who are more affluent listen to Junkie XL and I was like, I'm in this picture and I love it. It's like, that's me. That's literally me. I. Uh, um, on that list there is like, oh look, Junkie XL, hi. <laughs> um, I may or may not have been listening to their remix of Little Less Conversation whilst I was reading this paper. But also the things like the bands that I can see on there that are in my collection, uh, I'm matching up with the market segmentation. So this is kind of like a validation of my particular uh, lifestyle as a thing that's happening. There's also one of the things you'll find, the longer you spend in marketing, the more often you will have a moment of looking at a piece of data and going, hey, I can see myself from here. All right, part two of the audio video collection. Let's talk about video. Now, one of the things I will say about video is there's a lot of snobbishness you can do um, about whether it should be done in vertical or horizontal. I'm quite frustrated that we've never really gotten TVs and monitors into vertical uh, as a going concern. So you're never really going to be able to release a TV series in vertical. But we hold our phones this way most commonly. So when we are filming, selfieing, or otherwise, unless we have actively and proactively trained to rotate. But as XKCD says, that's the future and that's the new angle. Also, there is no significant difference between 16 by 9 and 9 by 16. Uh, I have said some snobbish and dumb things in the past about um, how 16 by 9 is the way it's supposed to be done. Uh, the only reason I'm filming 16 by 9 for all this is that I'm targeting desktops and laptops as my primary distribution channels. And the day comes that the data source says most of what we're doing is people watching my stuff off phones. I'm not gonna be doing it that way. I don't feel that there is a inherently better. It's actually quite important to say that as well because it's very easy to get, to decide that there are 
dumb hills of discrimination that are worth enforcing. And vertical versus horizontal is a dumb hill, but the fundamental principle is you are trying to enforce some form of discriminatory behavior of saying one thing is not right, not I don't like it and I prefer another, but it is wrong. And that's, that's not a good pathway to go down. Video, video focus sites. Also, one of the things on this is uh, the difference between a number of the elements of save to disk versus play from disk versus stream. If you've got a DVD collection, good on you. I've got some. Uh, I have a lot of things that I watch off my hard drive. I have a lot of things that I stream directly from the internet over YouTube. It is, again, neither a better nor worse. It's a what's best for you, what do you get the most value from it. So there's a few things in here around video focus sites. One of the things that I wanted to highlight is the idea of curation. That the video sites are much more likely to let you build up playlists which is quite interesting because quite a number of the audio sites don't focus on playlists. Spotify does, but it's less important on SoundCloud and less important on Bandcamp. Um, so curation through playlists, uh, subscriptions, and the subscription-based model is borrowing from the old print media. It's closer to magazine subscriptions than it is to television. Uh, the other thing about it is to me, the video focus sites, now YouTube's the dominant, Vimo is Vimo, it's, it's there, it's not really great. The one after YouTube, the Nike to YouTube's Adidas is the one I'm waiting for. YouTube kicked off in 2006, it's so uh, not that old, uh, and it's getting progressively worse. And it's getting conservatively worse as well as the YouTube algorithms are leaning against the content creators who made the platform viable in the first place. And this is a historical thing about video focus sites is your sex workers, queer and LGBTQIA plus communities tend to be the communities who first adopt a new technology build it up, make it, find all its use case scenarios, build a community around it, and are the first to get kicked in the head by uh, the net third round of corporate funding. And there is actually a group of conservative funding agencies who go out to put this money in to third round IPO projects to get rid of those types of content creators. They make it a condition of the money going in. The reason I mention this is that this, the factors that we've got here, the streaming, the no download, the um, doesn't reside to the hard drive, also suits audiences who need to be able to dip in and dip out of content. And audiences that don't want to be tracked have a much better need for streaming and streaming with deletable, um, no history and no recommendation engine. The exact antithesis of where YouTube is trying to head. So the value offer of the video experience. Video is immersive. Video is also very communicative. Uh, I have shifted to using the split screen video here where I appear on screen much more as part of this. Uh, this is Again, I've relayed out all my PowerPoint files to so let me do this. But basically the idea is that the person can be presented and the image, the ideas. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of the non-verbal communication elements that you can transmit through video that you don't get through audio per se. Uh, and there are other things that basically kick into gear that, are around, that we know about, that we're familiar with as marketers. So value here is really broad, but also there's a lot of co-creation from how we use video as consumers, but how we use video as producers. Here, the video that I create is transmission. It is me talking to my experiences across 
a set of elements to provide education, influence, and instruction. Using the same equipment, using the same setup, but not the same slides, I could be doing archival documentation. I could be talking. Uh, it's one of the things that TikTok is very good for, is that snapshot of the moment, the historical archival reflective. Uh, Instagram videos are very good for embracing the moment and bringing the moment to others, sharing the moment. YouTube has a great capacity when it's post-produced content. Whereas Twitch is about the real time, the live and the one to many to one engagements. So there's a bunch of different ways in which the video can create value for us as producers. So in terms of pricing, uh, it's expensive to make video. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I've spent way too much money on cameras and equipment and hardware, but also things like captions. If you want good quality captioning, it's a dollar a US a minute. And if you're doing a 90 minute episode, I'm looking at around 130 to $150 per video to get captioned of the lectures. That's something that, that is a cost, uh, but also in terms of me pricing it, going, well, how long do I want? How am I gonna do this? From consumer side, what we see is we see free, freemium, and premium. Uh, now, there is an argument to be made that the people who are prepared to subscribe to your channel are the people you should be showing adverts to because they're the people with discretionary income who want to support you. Interesting, but not always that good. We also have seen a number of different ways in which you can do subscription-based payment. Uh, What's interesting with YouTube to some extent is it knows that it is absolutely dependent on you, the con creator of content, to maintain its relevance. So it hasn't started charging as many different tiers of premium access as I thought it would have by now. It's been around for 15 years, 16 years. Vimo, on the other hand, charges the producer for how much content is accessed, uh, which shows also why we don't host on Vimo. Uh, I don't agree with that as a principle. I don't agree that uh, if I am setting up a video hosting service and I am drawing revenue from each time a video is played, I do not then have get to charge the person whose content I'm making money from. That, to me, is a questionable action. Vimo, on the other hand, doesn't appear to be making money each time it streams a video, so they're just bad at what they do. The other place money and price comes into this is where you are looking at from the perspective of the ongoing costs to create and to produce and then monetize through distribution. Uh, there's lots of stuff, the costing side as consumers, uh, again, most of our major platforms that we're putting video onto, they have seen video as a metric that is important to them for their uh, growth and their uh, easy to measure metrics that they can go and get funding on. So they haven't started charging for the distribution, but I suspect yet is the key word there. All right, non-financial price considerations on the consumption side. It's real time to watch. Oh my God, is it beyond real time to produce? So to edit one of these lecture videos, the week one lecture, the auto cut software that I use to cut out uh, these long spaces, these long spaces, the, and the pauses and the dead air, it, ran through um, in, it took 15 minutes to edit out those spaces from a 90 minute video. The consequence of that many cuts is that when I went to render my 90 minute video is it took three hours to render. So it's well beyond real time. I can sit here to a camera and talk for 90 minutes straight, 
throw that straight to YouTube and be done with it. But if I push it through any form of editing, I have not only the real time of me producing the original, I have the post real time production, which on average, on my own personal YouTube show, where the episodes are around 15 to 20 minutes in length, it takes me about uh, a day and a half to edit. Uh, it's all post-production, cutting down things, editing things, creating elements. So it's well beyond real time. It's a massive time effort. Uh, same for effort. I'm quite the veteran of using this software. I've been doing video editing since the 1990s. Uh, I'm using platforms I'm familiar with and it's difficult. It is time consuming and it's challenging. And there are things that I have learnt this year because I started creating a YouTube channel that I didn't know last year when I was recording this stuff. I'm recording the current lecture in 2023. The uh, other thing on this uh, in terms of energy is uh, for all of you who've come off the back of a Zoom meeting, God, I'm so exhausted. It's talking to a uh, camera is a very strange energy drawing experience, but it's definitely high energy. It's just a thing. You get used to it, you build up match fitness and you get better. But the first couple of videos that you do to camera are exhausting. And then the 35th one in this semester, either you're too tired to care or you've built match practice. Now lifestyle. Uh, this is something that's kind of interesting here is the idea of the video creates the parasocial connection, the parasocial communication, which also drives the idea of the micro celebrity and the public profile. It's okay to not want that. Uh, I'm an egotistical guy. I've got um, 25 years of being in the public eye. I've been a lecturer. I've been a I give comment to the media, so I'm okay with being on TV, being on radio, being in print. Not everyone is, and not everyone wants it, and it's okay to not want it. Equally, it's okay to use you know, just your voice or do other ways that the video can be produced uh, that don't feature you on screen so that you aren't having to put up with the things that go with it. But, you know, as you might have noticed, um, Every season I give lectures to students. So for the past 20 years of doing this, I've built up quite a catalog of people who can recognize me on the street now. Last thing, risk. Uh, there's a lot in video production. Everything from, well, every aspect of risk is there. But in particular, the two I want to emphasize is the social pressure of second guessing yourself as you commit yourself to a semi-permanent to permanent medium and the functional risk that the video you record doesn't work it doesn't go the way that you would expect it to or it doesn't look right or the audio is wrong or you've spoken for 90 minutes and it wasn't recording all those are functional things those are all uh, challenges and The distribution aspect, there's one of the things, I've mentioned the mediated, the mediated and tangible because that little trailer that we run at the start of these uh, lectures comes from remixed footage that I've got through my Envato license. Uh, there are a couple of things, I don't think you can print video out, it's always been fascinating. Uh, very early in the days of when we first transferred to Wattle and we were talking about how much space we needed on a learning management system. I said, look, I'm going to need more space than you're giving me. Uh, and so I said, well, what do you expect students to print 20,000 pages out? I don't know how you'd print video, mate, but I don't think that's it. Uh, technically, eight millimeter film is printed video, but that's not the point. Now I want to see if I can do it. Uh, you have things like the transport or well, tangible, you can still move this to a different medium. You can medium shift, uh, so you can take this recording, stick it on a USB, play it somewhere else. Equally, if you had the right equipment, you could turn this digitally created recording and stick it onto a VHS tape 
I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you could. It's there for the taking. Lastly, digital, most of the time when we're thinking about video and we're thinking about the internet, we are thinking about the digital intangible and we're thinking about it from the perspective of streaming like a Netflix or a YouTube. Whereas when we're on the production side, it's very much the digital tangible. You record, the file is created, and then you work with a, you work to create a digital artifact, a digital file, which you then put into a system so it can be streamed. Uh, it's a very interesting reversal that as someone who watches a lot of YouTube, that I retain none of those files, but when I create for YouTube, I have this huge catalog of basically broken parts, uh, subsections of video clips, files I didn't end up using in the last in the master mix. I would probably for a four gig file, which is what 15 minutes of high res looks like, have about 15 gig of background material, including art files and graphics files and all sorts of other things. So there's a lot more on the digital tangible on the production of a video than there is on the consumption. So let's talk a couple of case studies. The most obvious one on the um, straight up TikTok. I I'm I don't have a TikTok. Um, I don't want to have a TikTok. Uh, it's not just because I think I'm too old for it. I'm the wrong market share. There is a paper on TikTok that shows what it's about, and it is about the capturing of the moment. It is actually much more of a reflective tool than you would necessarily recognize. So a lot of the consumption of TikTok in terms of production, consuming it to produce it, is about capturing an experience or capturing the moment. It is, in fact, a mindfulness reflective behavior for which I'm generally terrible at it. Like, I'm not kidding when I say the reason the ePortfolio exists is that this is what the medium is about. And I need you to train in it to be good at it because it's hard, it's difficult, you've got to be taught it, you've got to learn it, you've got to practice it. And I don't have those skills and I have not gained those skills, nor have I put myself into an opportunity to learn those skills in an applied sense. I don't, again, don't have a TikTok but I have seen that this is something that needs to be taught and I have learnt them to the point that I can train them. Uh, YouTube, platform of choice. There are so many things wrong with YouTube and that's really frustrating. Uh, there is a lot, a lot that's wrong with YouTube, but basically it's also the biggest goddamn mechanism that you've got. So yes, it's the worst option you've got, and it's the worst option that's the best choice to use. Vimo is not, Vimo's not viable. Vimo's dead in the water. Just hasn't realized it's not getting its next round of funding yet. TikTok, well, there are constant cries to go and have it shut down, put away, banned, removed from um, Google Store and iTunes. TikTok, when it falls, we'll just see all the same problem being identified on YouTube and people will want to get rid of YouTube. The two biggest threats that these things create is that they create mechanisms by which the average punter can create and distribute their own content and that's more terrifying to the major labels and the gatekeeper distribution networks than anything you could imagine. Now from a co-creation perspective there's a lot of stuff around YouTube to be a facilitation mechanism for us to go presumption. Um, I think presumption in YouTube is brilliant, but there's also a downside. There's a lot of things that are wrong with the algorithm. There's a lot of barriers to letting content that is legal, morally acceptable, socially supported, publicly high profile and publicly supported. There is one gatekeeper filter mechanism, which is YouTube, and it operates behind a bunch of unknown, unknowable algorithms, which is automated stupidity coded and coded hard by Google. Very frustrating. Twitch, equally, um, it's broken. 
is absolutely broken. It has got so many problems with copyright strikes. It's doing some really dumb things regarding interruptions, uh, forced interrupts with advertising that the uh, Twitch streamer cannot control. And it's something that's really frustrating because the idea that the Twitch management at Twitch sees Twitch being used in a certain way and it codes the platform to facilitate the way management sees it being done. Whereas the co-creation of Twitch and the different various ways that Twitch has been used and reconsidered and reimagined doesn't mesh with what the Twitch code base um, and the Twitch ma uh, management base thinks. And it's very frustrating as someone who is into lead user innovations and likes seeing people doing this. And funnily enough, the bottom line of this was a game streaming platform that people went, I could also just like use it for streaming me and I could sit around the place talking to people. So the just chatting genre was not an intentional initial design of Twitch. It's one of its biggest elements now. Uh, there's lots of problems. Again, Twitch, similar thing. Lots of problems, lots of gateway barrier problems coming from Twitch being one of three major distribution outlets that is controlled opaquely. Uh, again, it's democratized it to a, an extent, but it hasn't completely cleaned it up. And also, there's a bunch of dumb decisions that get made to pre proactively or preemptively block content that isn't a problem. Um, again, when we look at who's pulling the strings, who's funding and doing the investing, these channels should be better than they are. And they've got every right to be better than they are. Technologically, Twitch and YouTube are absolute technological marvels of the modern era. They are the pyramids and the Great Wall of China of contemporary technology. They are just huge infrastructure elements that are phenomenal. But if you imagine that in 50 years time, we're gonna still be talking about Twitch, it's hard to imagine compared to however many thousand years all these other pieces have been up. These are phenomenal foundational, but also they are the beginning. This is the starting point. Twitch isn't that old. So there are better versions of it out there yet to be developed and yet to show up. Because that's the other thing to remember is that I always talk about the idea of Adidas and Reebok and Nike. And this is a history lesson briefly on the way past. Adidas dominated the sports shoe market. Its rival was Reebok. They were the one-two. They were the unassailable duopoly of sports shoes. And then Nike came through and murdered both of them in their sleep and took their market share. I look at your Facebook and Twitch and YouTube and all these pseudo monopolies and think you're going to get done by the, the Nike. The technological Nike is going to come through and absolutely clean house on you. You are not that. You are Reebok. You are the Reebok of the internet. And Twitch is the Reebok of live streaming. We haven't seen its successor yet, but its successor will be phenomenal. All right, theory and application. One last thing to talk about. Uh, this is what I mentioned, the TikTok article. Geez, talk about getting called out by an academic paper. The drivers to use TikTok, archiving and self-expression, to preserve a sense of the presence. I do not have an archival behavior pattern and I don't like archival, I don't like the archival aspect. Uh, best way to describe this is for all of you who keep diaries, I have amazing respect for you, but I don't even keep a to-done list anymore. My to-do list is always written in erasable so that when I'm through it, I can just scrub it out and don't look back. I believe very much in perfect is the enemy of done. Done is the ally of getting to the next point and you just put the foot down and keep going. You don't look back. And to quote the, to 
quote a certain Edna Mode. I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. Very much, I don't have the archival behavior. But I could never understand. I was getting really frustrated by TikTok because I was thinking, oh my God, I've turned into an old man. I don't get it. And it's annoying me that I don't get it. Then I realized the reason I don't get it is that fundamentally it facilitates a behavior that is absent from my lifestyle. I barely use save files. <laughs> so, with that in mind, it is the episode done. If you need me, you know where to find me. Welcome back to uh, Series 2 of eMarketing 2022, the year, and eMarketing MKTG 2023, the subject. And that is that.